please welcome Rick Cotton, Senior Counselor for IP Protection at NBC Universal, and John Landgraf, CEO of FX Networks. Well, good afternoon. Um, I might start this, uh, start this out. Uh, I'm Rick Cotton, uh, was general counsel of NBC Universal for many years now, uh, focused exclusively on anti-piracy issues. Uh, many of you may be wondering about my sling. Maybe I'll just say by saying that there just are some hazards in fighting pirates. <laughs> um, I'm uh, uh, here with an honor to be here with uh, John Landgraf. Uh, and thought I might just pose a question, John, here to you to, uh, to kick this off. I think, in all fairness, John is really one of the leading executives in the, uh, in the film and television, primarily on the television side. Uh, he was involved with some of the major uh, hits, I have to say, at, uh, at NBC in the, in the uh, era of uh, ER and West Wing, and then moved to, uh, to Fox, and in the 10 years he's been at FX, the list of hits that he has uh, that he has developed at FX is is astonishing. Um, but with that background, as an executive who has been charged uh, and been involved in the creative process, maybe you could start this discussion out. Obviously, the discussion up to now has been the legitimate side of the digital world and the efforts the industry has been making and struggling with in terms of how do you reach millennials, how do you make content more available in the digital uh, ecosystem. Uh, as you said, as, uh, as an executive in the business, uh, how do you view the, the, what I might call the dark side, the, uh, uh, the siphoning off of an enormous amount uh, of, uh, of content from pirate sites? How do you view that uh, from where you sit? Well, look, I, th I, think, I think any tool, even, even the greatest tool perhaps humankind has ever made, still can be used for positive as well as negative effects. And you know, any, any vast ecosystem needs some form of laws, I think, to, <clears throat> to protect the innocent, if you will. And you know, from my standpoint, there are, there's a lot of really dynamic, really exciting things happening in the digital, digital space, including things with our own content, where I'm really excited about the transforming process of, of of distribution and the transforming process of consumption and the consumer having much better um, flexibility and access to the content. <clears throat> but there are some bad actors out there that are pretty relentless in terms of uh, stealing this content without compensation and, and earning money. And um, from my standpoint, you know, I'm not so much concerned about the bottom line of of our, of our company, although that's, that's my job, but what I'm concerned about is the fact that we produce a lot of content in partnership with creative people. We hire thousands and thousands of people who are essentially working people whose, whose living wage and compensation and benefits come from the economics of the business, and not to mention the fact that we're in partnership with a lot of writers and producers and directors and actors. And there's this myth in Hollywood, you know, the so-called Hollywood accounting myth that, you know, that people who sit in my chair spend their entire lives trying to screw creative people out of their, their rightful profits, and that's not true at all. Almost every show that we produce that's a successful show is profitable, and we send out profit checks to people, and ultimately I'm very concerned that for the foreseeable future, people who make their living through the process of creation, of creating ideas and stories, which is what I really care about, have the ability to be compensated for that. And you know, there are obviously a lot of forces out there that, that don't believe that, that believe essentially they, they should do it for free. Um, I saw a fascinating piece that David Byrne wrote <coughs> about music piracy in which he was basically saying that, look, for him, he's made a pretty good living in the music business and he can also put together a concert any, anytime he needs to if he needs to earn money, but he's really concerned about the new person coming up. And this hundreds and hundreds of vitriolic posts. It was a very thoughtful, very respectful piece that he wrote. And there were hundreds of vitriolic posts basically saying, anybody who's wor who, who works on anything creative should be willing to do it for free. And I don't really understand that. To me, labor is labor. Labor is, is, is worthy of compensation, whether that labor is spent writing code, entrepreneurially developing a new business, 
building something, providing legal services, or inventing a story? Well, I, I, I think what I would, uh, we, we come at this from, uh, you come as a business executive, as a creative executive. I've spent my uh, time working on the policy, somewhat on the legal side, and looking across sectors. But the, the fact of the matter is, if you sort of pull back from the perspective you've just been discussing, uh, the United States economy is not, uh, does not aspire to be a low-cost manufacturing economy. I mean, the fact is, across all the high-growth sectors, what our competitive advantage globally is our creativity, our innovation, our technical invention. And what we face now with modern technology and with modern transportation is we face really an assault on that competitive advantage. And if we simply sit back and allow others, uh, particularly outside the United States, to basically steal uh, what drives our economy, that's not a bright future. And so the con we're having this conversation specifically within the framework of TV and film and the creative industries. It really exists across the entire economy and is a broad challenge to take note of the scale on which this is happening and to ask the question of what can be done so that we enjoy the economic benefits, as you were saying, of creators, of creativity, of innovation, uh, and uh, in other sectors of technical invention. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, honestly, <clears throat> intellectual property is one of the United States' uh, biggest exports, and it's also one of its most important ex exports in terms of our cultural values. And, um, and ultimately, I know enough about the economics of the business that, it, that, that, that it, you know, we need to be able to uh, retain uh, a measure of control and ownership over a, a, a some reasonable period of time in order to make these very expensive pieces of content available. You know, uh, I, I think it's hard for people to understand how truly difficult it is to make a movie or a television series. You, know, you, you, you see Robert Redford in All Is Lost and you know, he's wet for two hours in the movie and it's hard to realize that he was wet for 50 days and his crew was wet for 50 days. It's, it's actually a grueling amount of labor and it's very capital intensive to make this kind of high quality uh, content. And we're trying to preserve uh, you know, a viable economic pathway to continue to do that well into the future. So I wonder, um, I don't want to get lost in statistics, but do we have the ability to put up um, uh, just a couple of numbers? I mean, we're not talking about small scale issues here. I mean, at the present time, best estimates are that 24% of the internet's bandwidth is devoted to uh, actually infringing traffic. Uh, it's growing. Uh, this was a study that came out earlier this year where it almost doubled uh, in, in two years. Uh, these are two graphs. The main point is the dynamic here, which is uh, what we're, we're not talking about a static event. This is not a question of what damage is being caused today. A lot of damage is being caused today. The issue is what about tomorrow? And if we simply sit back and let existing trends continue, uh, the future is not a pleasant one. Uh, what this slide is, uh, I'm not going to be able to read it, but all the way on the left, the black bar, at least left as I'm looking at it, uh, is Pirate Bay. The red bars are legitimate content sites. The only point is we've wound up, and this, these are monthly unique visitors, and Pirate Bay has 60 million unique visitors, far more than any legitimate site, and particularly far more than ABC.com, NBC.com, Fox.com, uh, more than Netflix. And so we've wound up with an ecosystem, which is unfortunately a wash in illegitimate content. And these sites are for-profit criminal sites. And so I think the challenge for the business is how do we wind up working with the ecosystem in order that this degree of traffic, patronizing sites that are completely devoted to making profits illegally doesn't continue at the scale that it currently exists. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, people misconstrue this as a problem of, <clears throat> uh, you know, people living in their mother's basement who don't have the wherewithal to buy a movie who are essentially pirating a movie. But in fact, that's, you know, these are, there's a lot of involvement of organized crime. Some of the same organizations that are involved in human tra trafficking, drug trafficking, even in some cases terrorism, 
are involved in piracy, they're offshore for the, for, the, for the most part. They're not inside America's borders. And though there's the exception of the story of Kim.com, where the US government was able to essentially shut down his site after, by the way, he made 170, or estimated 175 million in illicit profits off of it. The, the fact is, there's no way for us to get to these sites. There's no legal um, there's mechanism. And obviously, there was an attempt made to try to be able to delist some of these sites in terms of internet search in the United States. That was the so-called Sopa Pippa uh, battle. And you know, that was framed as, as Hollywood trying to break the internet. So the reality is there's no way to, to, at this point anyway, to either delist those sites, to do anything to essentially cut down on their traffic, or to shut them down. Not, notwithstanding the fact that vigorous efforts are made in every, way, every legal ma manner to try to do so. So John, you mentioned mega upload. Uh, let me try to connect the dots again in terms of what, the, what this conversation is about, which is when mega upload was shut down, this is a study, uh, it's an article on a study that was done at Carnegie Mellon University. They looked at uh, several countries internationally and in the months right after the shutdown, this was of one site, albeit the largest operating uh, cyber locker devoted to uh, to illegal content, you could actually see digital sales. Again, what this conference is about is to talk about the evolution of the digital ecosystem to wind up providing consumers with content where, when, and how they want it. Those sites in several countries, with the shutdown of one site, showed an increase in their ability to provide consumers legitimate access to content. So if, if we're going to wind up with the evolution to provide people with what they want, it's, it's almost impossible for these new business models to compete with free. And yeah. th I think that's the, what we ought to be talking about. Yeah, that, that's really the, the most important point, which is not that, <clears throat> not that there's any belief on my part, certainly, and I, and I don't think any of my colleagues at 21st Century Fox believe that we shouldn't be providing uh, better technology, better user interfaces, more fluid multi-platform access, different means to the consumer of consuming the content. Uh, there's actually a lot of work done continuously on how to try to evolve the way the content is distributed and the ecosystem into which it's distributed to try to improve that. And there's a recognition, recognition that, that there's a long way to go to achieve that. But, but we've licensed our content to more than 300 legitimate digital distributors on a worldwide basis. And as Rick said, how, how are they supposed to compete with free? You know, ultimately, when somebody then does want to start a business, does have an idea for how to create a legitimate digital business, um, I think it's very difficult for them to stand up and put the kind of cap human and, and financial capital and time into that, um, into that in, you know, investing and in doing that if essentially what they're competing with is uh, give us your name, and you know the content is free. That that free is a pretty tough business model to compete with. Well, and the, the free that we're talking about is, I mean, these sites that we're talking about are highly profitable to the individuals that operate. I think, as you referenced, uh, Mega Upload generated 175 million dollars in top line revenue over about six years. If you look at uh, any of the, of the illegal sites, whether they're torrent sites, storage sites, linking sites, behind them is a revenue and a business model. And it's a highly profitable one because they are stealing content, they're not paying for it, and they are generating, either through advertising or through subscriptions, revenues that make it very, very profitable for the individuals that, that run it. Yeah, I mean, for, for those of you who, uh I'm sure, I'm sure most of you probably already know this, but it, it, it's, it's worth your time just to you know, go on a search and you pick your favorite search engine and just search these sites. They look to all extents and purposes like legitimate sites. They have uh, major credit cards and or PayPal uh, accounts associated with them. We do everything we can to try to essentially shut down those uh, legitimate sources of payment, but ultimately you know, banks operate in a licensing agreement with the credit card companies, so you shut down, you get one bank to take it, take it down and essentially another bank will put it back up. 
Uh, and also there's an enormous amount of legitimate advertising. So you go on a site, you can do this in, in, in the United States. I, I, I searched for Avatar recently and there was a full version of Avatar available and there was a Volkswagen commercial adjacent to it. So you're talking about national blue chip advertisers essentially associated with uh, pirated content in a site that looks very professional. Um, you know, it's, I think it's even difficult for the consumer in some cases to understand that what they're dealing with is not, uh, is not a legitimate business. Well, I think just, just to put up one example of what you're talking about, this is a pirate site, has an Acura ad on it, actually has a U.S. Forest Service ad on it, and uh, we don't have a slide on this, but because this was a report which just uh, is reported on by Adweek today, but their, the estimate of this report uh, was that, uh, to a, a sample of sites, was that nearly a quarter of a, million, a billion dollars a year, 220 plus million dollars a year, in advertising revenue is going to a subset of, uh, of these sites. And that's the, that is the dynamic of what exists in the ecosystem today. Look, in, in many cases, you know, we need more help from the so-called gatekeepers of the internet to try to, to try to do this. And you know, there has been some movement in that regard. For example, Google has put a filtration system in YouTube, um, and you know, we went, we went ahead and took on the cost of watermarking all of our content. Um, it's not foolproof, and there's a dispute mechanism so that essentially, frequently, even if the filter catches something, it doesn't take it down. Um, it actually refers it to us to, to re-review it and confirm that it's our content. And that re-reviewing is many people full-time job just looking at content. I think our frustration is we wish that the sometimes the filter would just take it down and then let the that the let the person that posted it dispute it because there is a dispute button it'll go back up. Then we can only look at we could just look at the things that were disputed essentially that were put back up and verify that they are not our legitimate content. And so we're still struggling a little bit with the. Uh, the most fluid, the easiest process possible, but there's been some, some progress made. But in this regard, I think the, 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 the entire advertising serving ecosystem, which is in many cases automated, so I'm not saying that these are not uh, substantial technical challenges, but ultimately we really need help. There's nothing we can do essentially to, to present, prevent this and for blue chip advertisers in the US government essentially to be having their ads served adjacent to pirated content is, is really a problem. It's something that needs to get fixed and needs to get fixed sooner rather than later. Well, I, I, my own reaction is that there's, there's, there's both good news and bad news in that. Obviously the bad news is that there's currently very substantial advertising funding flowing to these sites. There's very substantial subscription revenue flowing to many of these sites through major payment processors, but the flip side of that is that there's actually something to be done. I mean, the fact is this ecosystem, look, I mean, the, the broadband internet is actually relatively young. Uh, it's, pick, whether it's 10 years, 15 years at the absolute outside. And the fact is that it has grown up without real focus on the issue of how does one wind up with a rule of law? How does one wind up making it more difficult for illegal sites like the kind we're talking about to function. And so the result is we've, we've been a bit too casual and cavalier. And the result is that this ecosystem has wound up, not necessarily advertently, but supporting these sites. And so I think what the, the direction that the conversation is going, as you point out, there are most of, many of the sectors that we're talking about have taken some steps. YouTube has put its filtering system in. The major ISPs, I think in terms of major steps, the five major ISPs in the US have put into effect a notice sending system uh, to individual subscribers who have been identified as uploading or downloading uh, content uh, improperly. And that's really, that's the first time in this ecosystem where there's been that very high volume messaging as to what kind of behavior is appropriate or not. <coughs> appropriate. Look, I, I want to jump in and say that I, I do think that, that if a mechanism is, is put in place by which uh, pirated stolen content is, uh, is identified, right, so that the user of an ISP gets a notice that says, do, are you aware that the content you're, 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 you're pulling through our pipe is not authorized content? 
if the advertisers were aware, could be aware that their content, their, their advertising is being put next to illegitimate content, I think that would knock down the bulk of the, the bulk of the problem right there. Just literally simple awareness of what is and is not legal and what is and is not, uh, you know, a, appropriate. You know, cable theft still happens. There are still people with illeg illegitimate boxes that are stealing cable, but it used to be a cool thing. Now it's not a cool thing. Most people pay for cable. There's going to be a few dedicated users who are going to figure out a way to steal it. And then you look at that, that, that smaller part of the pie, that's people who are fully aware that they're, that they're involved in illegal activity and very committed to it. And what you need to be able to do is figure out how to get to the most committed and most pernicious organizations, you know, the, 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 the true criminal organizations that are offshore, that are involved in all kinds of other bad things, and be able to figure out how to interdict that, right? There's still going to be some leakage out of the system. I don't think anybody thinks that it can be perfect. Ultimately, you'd have to shut down the internet for it to be perfect. And all tools, legitimate tools, have illegitimate uses, right? So I don't think anybody here is saying that we should shut down the internet because there's a little bit of piracy going on. I think what we're saying is that <clears throat> while it was, imp I think, very appropriate and, and still remains appropriate for there to be a little bit of wiggle room while this big, massive business and fantastic tool is getting up on its feet, that it's time for it to come into the grown world of real businesses that operate within the law and figure out how to both identify and, and make the consumer aware of where the content is pirated and start to be a little bit more selective about, about advertising and things like that. Um, that's not going to eliminate the problem entirely, but it's going to take it down to a manageable dull roar, and that's something that, that we can live with. Now, I, I really think that's a critically important point, which is no one, no one is talking about trying to get to 100%. And there, frequently in these conversations, you wind up with discussions of, well, every lock can be picked, uh, every protection can be hacked. But in some sense, that's just the nature of the world. If a burglary occurs in a particular neighborhood, our, our uh, reaction to it isn't to say, oh, we'll shut down the burglary unit. It's, you, you try a little harder in a particular part of town. The point, but the point is the expectation is that bad, some amount of bad behavior is going to occur. There will always be rogue copies. There will always be people who are committed uh, to accessing them uh, without paying illegally. But the point is the scale of what is going on now is what is causing the problem. And one, so what one is talking about, one is not talking about mashups. One is talking about the wholesale illegal distribution of whole films and whole TV programs, and by the way, the list goes on, of whole books, of whole sports programs, of whole pieces of software, whether entertainment or uh, business software. It, it is this really across the board trafficking in the theft on a high volume basis of uh, creative content. And that is really what we're talking about. And really, I would say sectors of goodwill, individuals of goodwill, should really be willing to address and, and figure out ways that the broadband internet ecosystem is not supporting that. And that we're careful about a whole lot of other values and we're careful not to go, go too far. But really, John, as you say, in terms of that set of activities, we really should uh, be working hard to reduce the amount of wholesale theft. Yeah, Rick, there's, there's one slide I really want to make sure we get to because I, I think one of the things that I've, that I've heard frequently used as an argument um, is that essentially piracy is, is only the result of our, Hollywood presumably's, unwillingness to make the content available legitimately. Uh, that if we would only make it available legitimately, that piracy would essentially either dry up or eliminate. So that spike you're seeing there is actually what happens on the first day the legal di digital copy is available online. So when we make it available online, you see that, that sheer vertical cliff that looks like the ice wall out of Game of Thrones? Uh, that, is, that is the illegal, the spike in illegal activity that, oc that occurs on that day. So with due respect to those making the argument, it's, it's bogus. Essentially, we can make the content available legally, and all that does on some level is spur awareness of the title and spur illegal activity to the extent that it's available as ubiquitously as it is, as it is, as it is on the internet today. So I think we'll continue our conversation. If there are questions, uh, we'll be happy to fold them, fold them in. 
Um, I guess there is a question down here, if we can get a microphone. Is there a microphone? There's no mic. I'll try to speak loudly. OK. I don't know if they can hear me, but um, what's been done on the uh, legislative side, it seems like uh, going after the money would be the first place I would go after. Every one of those ads up there has to have a relationship between either uh, you know, the actual advertiser uh, or uh, a network. <laughs> Right. Right. So, so I'll, I'll repeat the question, which is, why can't there be legislation that addresses this, particularly on the money side, you know, that essentially makes the advertisers or others responsible for it? And I, look, I think Rick's going to be able to answer this question even better than I can. But essentially, a lot of the fight between Hollywood and Silicon Valley, in a way, has been over who's responsible. And the way the law is currently written right now, the entire burden of responsibility falls on the copyright holder, right? So essentially, there's, there's, a, there's a blanket shield, uh, immu shield of immunity from any kind of uh, uh, activity that might infringe on copyright. And you can understand why businesses that operate under that shield of immunity don't want to give up that shield of immunity, right? It's better, all things being equal, not to be fiscally, financially responsible for your actions. And it's better, all things being equal, to force the copyright holder to police the internet and make a whack-a-mole deal. And all I can tell you is that we try very hard uh, in every way we can through, through whatever legal means to get slightly better enforcement mechanisms such as those, but we get really, really strong pushback over anything that would place any form of liability, legal or financial liability, on those on the other side of the pirate transaction. The, 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 there's, a, there's a pretty hard pushback to make sure that all of the, the, the financial burden uh, and all of the, 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 the legal burden falls on the copyright holder. So, well, but, so let, let, me just right. say, let me just say one thing very quickly, which is on that front. Uh, I, I think the, the most promising way forward is through a set of best practices that are voluntarily adopted by the sectors that we're talking about. You wind up, uh, both legislation and litigation are very blunt tools. And if you can wind up with a sector like the advertising sector, uh, stepping up and recognizing that there's a problem and trying to work cooperatively to identify what are the commercially reasonable steps that a responsible advertiser, responsible ad network, uh, responsible ad server companies, ad exchanges can take to be sure that advertisements don't appear on these illegal sites. I think we'll wind up with a much more effective uh, regime than if we try to wind up with a regulatory or legislative one. Look, so, I th and I think that's on the table. So I would say I, I think that is the preferable way to move forward. Yeah, I really agree with that. That ultimately, you know, it's very hard to draft a law that doesn't have its own unintended consequences. The only thing I will say is that. Look, every regime has its strengths and its weaknesses. So the existing regime's, one of its strengths, essentially, is that it creates what would be called a safe harbor for activity, right, for entrepreneurial activity. And essentially, therefore, if you're running a site and there's some pirated content on it, for example, you're not going to have your site shut down or seized. On the other hand, it's, it's, I think it's a problem that we can have sites that are almost entirely pirated content that are, we can demonstrate beyond a reasonable doubt are entirely in business of selling pirated content. We have no means of, uh, of shutting them down. And the only thing I would say about the downside of the regime is ultimately who's going to care more about, the, about the, the, the theft of intellectual property, the owner or the person whose unintended consequence of their business model is, is fostering piracy, and by the way, who might even be po pro profiting in, in modest ways from that piracy through search or advertising or whatnot. So part of what we frankly need is, you know, we just need this young, fledgling, Wild West uh, industry, uh, which now has within its sector some, you know, companies that are much, much larger, frankly, than any of the entertainment companies. Perhaps there are individual companies that are larger than all the entertainment companies put together to sort of step up and join the, the league of adult citizens of the business community and essentially take some responsibility, at least in terms of uh, best practices and investing some resources. And again, some of that is taking place, but I think more needs to take place to invest some resources in essentially uh, looking after our priorities because the, the alternative, which is to fight it out in, 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 in the courts or fight it out uh, in Congress, is not really good for either side and not good for consumers either, I don't think. It, it might be worthwhile also pointing out there's another uh, announcement that was made today 
of uh, the, uh, an organization now called Creative Future, which is an effort to encourage uh, the creative community and voices in the creative community to speak out on this issue and to really work toward the kind of cooperative arrangements with the advertising world and the credit card world uh, that we're talking about in order to try to cut off funding for the sites that are doing the damage. Yeah, look, I guess the thing that I would just say that it comes down to for me is, you know, I, I, just, I just fundamentally believe in capitalism um, in the sense that I really believe that part of what motivates us to, 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 do, to create and to do our best work is, the, is the, uh, um, the incentive of gain from our work. And uh, to tell you the truth, if you look at the history of people who worked in creative pr pr professions, that is to say writers and actors and singers, you know, through most of recorded human history, they didn't make a living, right? They, they had to have a patron, a wealthy patron, essentially, to make a living. I don't think a system of patronage is essentially the best system for our culture. I think one way to looking at our culture is that it's only as good as, the, as what it makes, and that means it's only as good as the technology it makes, it's only as good as the stories it makes and the intellectual property it makes. I think the reason I'm in the business of, of, of working with creatives who make stories is I think stories have an inherently humanizing, positive value in society, and I just hate the notion of returning to some system in the future where creative people have to work uh, in a patronage system because essentially they don't have any means of gaining uh, legitimate um, compensation for their work. And, and ultimately, you know, if, if, if we believe that, that whatever somebody makes, even if a company like ours spends a couple hundred million dollars making a film, it should be available for free, I don't really see how that sustains our industries in the long run. Um, I'm not so worried to tell you the truth about the future of, of my part of, of, this, of this business. I probably only have another decade in the business and it'll be around, but I look at the younger people coming up below me, whether they're the executives who work for me or, or young creators entering the business, and I fear a little bit to tell you the truth about the future of the industry from their standpoint. So we have two more questions. I think we have about two minutes, so maybe if people can make them short, we can do it. We have one here and one here, I think. No, I'm sorry. Hi. Um, is it illegal for people to stream content, like just stream the video, not download the video from some of these sites? And then also, with the Pirate Bay, how is that making a profit right now? Like, aren't most of those torrents that are being uploaded people just volunteering their time to encode it? So, uh, again, just very quickly, because we don't have a lot of time, we can talk more afterwards. Almost all the torrent sites subsist on advertising, and uh, the major torrent sites have revenue driven in the millions of dollars. And rather than get distracted on the question of individuals, the answer to your question in terms of streaming is that the the wholesale streaming of whole works by the site is unquestionably illegal. It's, I mean, I would say it's illegal under the laws of, of virtually every country in the, in the world. I, I don't think we question. think going after individual streamers the way the recording industry went after individual downloaders is a good idea. I think we'd like to be able to do is shut, shut down people who are making a lot of money, millions of dollars, basically stealing content from creative people and from us and making those streams available. Right. I'm in the payments industry and we regularly turn down uh, file sharing services and others. I, the U.S. gambling laws I focused on payments and essentially shut down credit card payments in the gambling industry. I, I think something easily could be done similarly. I, I think a bigger problem, and I, I know your perspective on you've released the content, but I really have to disagree. I don't believe you're globally releasing the content. I often am looking for a show. I'll go to the network site. I'll go to Hulu. I'll go to Netflix. I can't find it anywhere. Um, I don't go to the pirate sites, but I can, I can see the temptation. Yeah, and and look, I think there's still an issue there. Yeah. I, I, I did say that I think that we're, we're in process, right? I, and I, I'm not going to argue that I think we're ahead of the curve. I think we're a little bit behind it. It, these are very complicated business relationships, such as the one that exists, for example, between 21st Century Fox, the company I work for, and Comcast, NBC, Universal. Um, but in fact, we are really trying very hard to work out business relationships that allow for more ubiquitous distribution. In fact, Comcast has a, a cloud-based VOD service called X1 that's a fantastic user interface. And in fact, we have licensed the vast majority of our content. By the way, we have rights holders we have to deal with. We don't have the rights to put everything on every platform. And so 
I can understand a consumer's frustration with the pace at which this is occurring. All I can tell you is that piracy is not helpful in terms of that pace, because ultimately, uh, you know, it, it undercuts legitimate business, right? So ultimately, what what you want is you want to figure out how to how to support uh, legitimate businesses that are trying to do this. And I can tell you that on the in in my other life as an executive, I am a relentless advocate of let's make this content available, let's push the technology, let's push the user interfaces, let's get it out there. But I do recognize that it, that, it, that for a, you know, this is an aircraft carrier, not a destroyer, right? It takes time for it to turn. Um, so while, while not a, a, a disagreeing at all with your contention that, it's, that the content isn't as fully available as it should be, I would still say that What's the value to the ecosystem of having uh, criminal enterprises stealing and profiting from the content? There should be a way to shut that down. But, but uh, John, the point you made before, I, I also agree. I think ultimately where we need to get to is where it is more convenient for the consumer to get it from legitimate and less convenient to get it from illegitimate. But I think it takes both, and this chart speaks exactly to that, which is on the very date that the industry has that made The chart's set up there right now, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, it's, on, it's what I'm looking at. No, you're why. absolutely right, but when I travel internationally, I can't get access to almost anything. Look, there's, yeah. a, there's a huge yeah. fight, for example, right now going on between, uh, internationally between rights holders and channels, right? The channels want the nonlinear content. When, when they're licensing it for their linear channel, they want the nonlinear content. They want to be able to put SVOD services, in many cases, really sophisticated, cloud-based, great user interfaces. And meanwhile, Netflix wants to buy it, and other services like Love Film and others want to basically launch their own. So you're having a fight in certain territories between an SVOD service that wants to license the content and put it out there and a linear channel that's already licensing that also wants to make that content available. And sometimes these fights that are basically over revenue and rights take a little time to sort, the, sort themselves out. But I'm not aware of anybody who's in, who's in the media industry, whether they're in a nonlinear portion of it or a linear portion of it, who doesn't think that the consumer needs more flexibility and more access to content by far than he or she is getting today and doesn't want to achieve that. It's just, that. it's just that, you know, I'm in the middle of some bruising fights right now where essentially I'm trying to get the right to do that in conjunction with the, the nonlinear aspect of our linear channels. And I got a rights holder over here who says, no, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to license to this person over here. So unfortunately, it just takes time. You know, that's the reality. It takes time. So this gentleman's been very patient. Last question, hopefully short. It's short. I, I just want to first agree that I believe the non-content owners do feel that they have a ironclad safe harbor from third-party liability. But when you actually read the DMCA, Section 512I is very clear that the um, safe harbors are conditional. They're not unconditional. And there are two prongs put in there by Congress, and the legislative history also reads that way. Why is it, do you think, that the that it's become um, considered that these safe harbors are ironclad and, con and unconditional, when the law is very clear that they cannot tolerate repeat infringers. That's um, a question for a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't think there's a short answer to that other than to say, uh, I, I think the bigger picture here is in part to make clear what you're saying, which is that there are, uh, in terms of the legal definition of safe harbors, there are requirements in terms of good behavior. Uh, but I think the bigger picture is that that conversation needs to take place with all of the various actors within the ecosystem that we've been talking about, and a recognition that it's better for the ecosystem. It really is better for everyone if, uh, if, if sites that are truly dedicated to illegal activities are not supported by the legitimate sectors that manage both financially and technologically the broadband internet. And I think that's the bigger, the bigger conversation. I mean, we can sue each other continuously and, you know, things can go through, you know, decades, half decades and decades of appeal and in various different jurisdictions and try to, mig you know, migrate all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, ultimately, as Rick says, that's a pretty blunt instrument for, for that. And essentially what you hope on some level is that you know, for all of us who benefit from the internet, uh, and certainly that's not where we earn the bulk of our revenue, but, cert but from companies that do, you know, there's a desire to essentially keep the parts of it that are the, vib the vibrant best of it and start to address some of the parts of it that are, that are not, you know, not helpful and not lawful. Um, at least that's what we're pushing for. Right. Yeah. 
you know. Well said. Thank you.